This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. With Women's Day coming around again, much attention has been focused on the issue of gender balance on boards. In particular here at the Australian Graduate School of Management, there's been discussion of quotas, where the boards should be forced to take more women. So I guess the key question is, do we need to do more? That's an issue Jen Dalitz has been examining. She's a founder of Sphinx, a social enterprise committed to improving gender balance in leadership. She's worked for many large Australian companies such as BT Financial Group, NAB and Arthur Anderson. She's also been awarded the Edna Ryan Award uh, for improving the working conditions of Australian women. Jen is with me now. So Jen, do we really need quotas just as they've got in Sweden, for example? Look, Gillian, I guess the quota debate is one that's been running hot for a number of years now. And you would have to say, given the lack of progress of gender balance and particularly the advancement of women on boards and in very senior leadership roles, that perhaps a special intervention like a quota would be timely. So we've seen in Norway that the quota actually related to the number of women on boards. The issue is how do you translate that to women in senior leadership roles? And that hasn't happened as a natural course in Norway. So there's a bit of uh, to and fro on both sides of the argument when it comes to quotas. But when quotas are suggested, they don't go down particularly well with much of the Australian business community. True. I guess no one likes interventions being placed upon them and you know people coming in and saying, this has to be done. But when you look at the fact that in Australia, women have comprised the majority of university graduates in commerce, economics, law degrees, all those feeder disciplines into leadership roles for over two decades now, and even now you'll see 1.3 women to every one man in our university system now, you'd have to say we're investing a lot of money in educating our women. Lots of women come through the AGSM's programs. Um, I know when I was studying there was, there was plenty of women. So perhaps quotas are the only way to make some real change in a quick way, which is what Norway's been able to achieve. It's that, it's that momentum of change, which maybe then you can pull back and say, OK, now that we've got a bit more balance, Let's re remove some of those interventions and let things flow more naturally. But how do you get away from the argument of affirmative action, very good for women, but are you always recruiting the best candidate for the job, which is, after all, what shareholders would like? Look, I think shareholders would like a lot of things, including the best possible return on equity. And what we know from Catalyst research all around the world, um, organisations like Catalyst have been studying this very issue for a long time now. And what we know is that the bottom line is much stronger, up to 35% higher on return on shareholder equity when there is a diverse uh, representation on the board. So actually, if shareholders want a better return, we do need to see women represented as much as men when it comes to leadership on the boards and in, and in those very senior decision-making and strategic roles in business. And you mentioned there some of the research that you've been presenting at some executive committees. Some of that's your own research. What is the actual conclusion of those? Look, I, you know, the, the findings are very much that when you diversify your, your um, intellectual capital, when you have um, a better representation of your community at the table, and when you represent those customers that you serve better and understand them and really get them, your organisation performs better. And, and what I see actually with those executives I'm working with from the very largest companies in Australia, some of those that I'm working with, actually at the top, they really get this. Some of the CEOs have really been grappling with this for a very long time. How do we get more women coming through the ranks? Not just in an entry level, but how do we have them progressing through the ranks and really making it to the top? That's what they want to see. And so they get that. What the challenge now is, how do we translate that into execution and see some of the real um, changes in culture and in workplace behaviours, um, in the way we recruit, in the way that we recognise talent and make sure that everyone's given an equal opportunity, even if your career um, progression and the way that you move through one role to another, even if it looks different, to make sure those people have the same opportunity to have input. 
uh, at the highest levels in organisations. So is it just down to recruitment and promotion which is holding women back or, or is there some other reason? Is there some good reason why women are not progressing up the career ladder? You know what, Julian, when I started out um, down this, uh, it was purely a curiosity that I, that I uh, started looking at this issue of gender balance um, when I was still working as a management consultant and I was you know, noticing the drop off of women uh, and I thought, there must be some simple way to fix this because if we could, we would save a lot of money in organisations. When you consider the talent that organisations lose when women leave the organisation and don't come back, usually we could estimate that for senior roles it's two times the annual salary it'll cost to replace that person. So I initially came at this thinking there's a great cost saving opportunity here. Um, what I now know is that there's great upside potential as well. It's not just about reducing cost. But what I also know is that it's really, really complex. So there's no one single silver bullet. However, what we do know is, yes, it is about policies, definitely. So flexibility policies, the way we recruit and promote, the way we involve our staff and engage them in the strategy and the execution of the strategy in the business. But it's also very much away from the policies. It's about the practices. It's about the way we do things around here. It's the way that we support people in our business and the way that we just make the workplace a place that everyone thrives in. And that's everyone regardless of what their personal circumstances are. And that's, that's the tricky bit really, is, is how do we actually change the way we do things around here. But if you're trying to change things, I've got to play devil's advocate just for a moment and suggest that maybe some men wouldn't like it. It will get their backs up if they see people being promoted over something they would have thought would be better for the job. Look, that's right. There's always a little bit of defensiveness from those who feel that they'll have... Um change thrust upon them and that it might not work for them. And it's true that um, there was a great study by Bain and Co uh, two years ago. And, you know, that middle management was certainly the area where the most resistance came from. So what that says to, to senior leaders is you need to engage those people early and bring them on the journey and help them to understand that actually what's good for the organisation as a whole will be good for them too. And when you worked in the corporate field, you must have seen some discrimination as well. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I think certainly in terms of overt discrimination, um, the days thankfully are largely gone of unfavourable behaviours in the workplace. But there's still a lot more covert um, discrimination that goes on today. And a lot of people refer to this as unconscious bias and the things that unconsciously go on. And they are rooted into kind of the values and the um, experiences that we've all had and that frame of reference that we bring to the workplace. And I guess, you know, we, we anchor a lot back to what it looked like for us when we were coming through the ranks, what it looked like for the people around us too. And it is looking very different now. And, you know, we have to catch up and keep pace with that. And considering that most of our, certainly our corporate businesses were built by men, you know, for men who largely went to work when women largely stayed at home and ran households and raised families. Um, there has been a huge shift in a short space of time, a relatively short space of time, and some people are still catching up with that. But thankfully, we have had great protection here in Australia that has seen most of the overt discrimination gone anyway. Uh, and are some sectors catching up a bit faster than other sectors? There must be some r real traditional industries out there. True. The sectors do vary quite a bit. But, you know, again, that's part of the challenge and it's a part of educating all the way from entry level all the way through. And I guess those areas that have been more traditionally male-dominated, you know, engineering, even some of the legal professions, although women have been the majority of graduates for two decades now, you know, what we still see is that women hold fewer than 20% of partnerships in law firms in Australia today. And actually, when you look at equity partners, it's down around 12%. So you'd have to sit and say, well, what's going on there? 67% of law graduates now are women. So it's not as easy as looking at, well, you know, where's the intake coming from? It is very much about how is decision making controlled in industries, in sectors, in organisations, and drilling down specifically to how do we influence those decision makers? So are there any specific improvements you'd like to see in Australia? The best thing that's happened in the last few years has been the change in the corporate governance reporting requirements for listed companies. So the Stock Exchange has said that 
as a best practice, they would like to see companies reporting on how they are managing gender balance and gender diversity in their workplaces, all the way from the board down. Now, a lot of people think this relates just to board positions, but it's not at all. It's actually about the whole organisation, and it was introduced in 2010, but was sort of mandatory for listed companies from the 1st of January 2011. So it's been running mandatorily for a year now, and what we can see is that you know, some companies are doing quite well in regards to their reporting and, the, and therefore the programs that they're putting in to support um, gender balance in their workplaces. Uh, not all though. And, um, you know, though some organisations are saying they want more time to do it. Some are saying they think it's not relevant to their business. A lot of the mining companies still don't have any women on their boards. So, and in terms of representation in their workplace, it's not looking much better either. So, those um, initiatives are great, they're driving change, um, but we're not there yet. Now your blog, it features your take, Jen, on gender balance and women in leadership. You're quite outspoken on that. Well, what's been the reaction in the corporate world? <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, not everyone likes what I have to say. I do call it as it is on the CEO blog, but uh, look, I think and the reason that I do is, although some would say it's a bit of a career limiting move, um, I, I just think it's really important for leaders to understand what is really going on. Um, you know, what really are the facts as regards gender balance? Because some people still don't even understand that women aren't equally represented. So a lot of people don't understand that only, well, we've now hit 12% of women on boards in our listed companies, the ASX 200 that relates to. If you go beyond the ASX 200, I can tell you that it drops down significantly. And actually the majority of 200 to 500 companies on the ASX don't have any women on their boards at all, not even one. We know from the research that if you are a shareholder, you'll get a better return if there are women on those boards. So people need to know who has women on their boards, who doesn't. In terms of the way that organisations are run, I think it's really important for leaders to understand what are the barriers for women? And what are the organisations that are doing it well in terms of attracting retaining, developing the very best women on their teams. You know, that is actually helpful as an employer to understand, you know, what, what could I do better to retain the very best talent in my workplace? And also in terms of, you know, how women are feeling, well, actually a lot of women working in challenging environments are looking for a voice, they're looking for someone to advocate for them and share some of their experiences. And you know what, some of those experiences are great and some of them aren't so great. And I think it's timely every now and again just to point out that though we have come a long way and though things are looking a lot better, that these are the circumstances that some people are working within. So I will report about you know, policies and practices going on in their workplaces that aren't working for them as much as the ones that are working for them. But I like sharing, sharing great stories as well, Julian, about you asked about sectors and which are doing better than others. And engineering's been one that's struggled quite a lot in the past. Um, but they had a year of women in engineering about four years ago now. And as a result of that, women really have fired up in that sector. And, you know, we now see that the Young Australian of the Year this year is a, um, is a young woman. And we actually see for the first time that the Engineering Association has a female president. So things are changing even in the most male-dominated industries. And I think that, you know, just sharing those stories and, and playing my little part um, goes some way to supporting companies and individuals on that journey. Well, you're certainly communicating to companies saying that they can improve their productivity, become much more high performing by increasing diversity. But how do you get that message across to, say, a young female graduate that they can succeed in whichever field they choose? Oh, look, actually, the, the graduates aren't the issue. They have very optimistic dreams and, um, and many of them go on to achieve that. But what we actually see is that, is that the, the age 30 to 40 bracket for women is the biggest challenge. You know, in your 20s and your late 20s particularly is when a lot of career opportunities for high performers get presented. And for a lot of women, it comes at an exact time when they've got this um, crossroads going on in their lives of, you know, do they pursue a, um, um, having family? Do they pursue their careers? And which path do they take? And can they indeed blend them both? But even if it's not a family implication, a lot of the time that's when women start coming up against the fact that their peers are definitely majority male. So they become a, a minority in their 30s um, in, their, in the level that they're at in the organisation. And that's a challenge because you will be the different one sitting around the table. It's also an opportunity, of course, because being different is good. We know we're taught that in all of our studies, being different is good. Um, but, it's, but it is a challenge that a lot of men never have to face because they, are, they from age 30 onwards, will 
have been and, all, and, and are currently the majority around the table. So it's a challenging time for women and that's really when um, I do a lot of work with organisations in working with programs for their women, in mentoring a lot of women and setting up programs within business for women and men to be mentored side by side to make sure that they get absolutely the best chance of retaining both their high performing men and women during that stage of their, their career and their life cycle. So finally, Jen, if you could sum it up and just improve one thing, what would that one thing be? Oh, look, the one thing has to be giving men and women the same opportunities in the workplace. And so, you know, if you're running development programs, make sure that half the participants are men, half the participants are women, all the way through from entry level, all the way through to senior management, because that giving that equal opportunity is the most important thing. If you have flexible workplace practices, make sure that men are taking them up as well as women. If you are looking at job redesign, make sure you look at roles that are traditionally held by men as well as held by women. So it's really about the balance. This is absolutely not about creating an environment in which you know, all the leadership roles are held by women because that wouldn't work either. But this is about creating balance, gender balanced leadership, gender balance in business all the way through from the entry level all the way through to the board. And, um, and it's got to be conscious and it's all about, you know, the checks and balances to make sure it's equal all the way through. Well, Jen, I'm sure you're going to continue to write for your blog, the CEO blog, and you're going to continue being outspoken. Jen Dallet, it's been great talking to you. Thanks, Gillian, and happy International Women's Day. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.